So, great. So, without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Susanna McCauley, uh, the Scientific Director, Interdisciplinary Research Partnerships at Stanley Mann Children's Research Institute, the Associate Director for Child Health and Director of the TL1 program at Northwestern University Clinical and Transitional Sciences Institute, the attending physician, pulmonary and sleep medicine at Ann and Robert H. Lurie Children's Hospital of Chicago, and the professor of pediatrics at Northwestern University School, Feinberg School of Medicine. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Dr. McCauley to get us started. Thank you, Dr. McCauley. Thank you, David. Um, it's nice to be here today. It's been a while since I've given a talk for the, to the Greater Illinois Chapter, and I see um, many people I know in the room, so thank you for coming. Um, I'm going to go ahead and put up my slides, um, and I just want to say we, um, I'm going to go through these at, at a pretty brisk clip, but um, I, I tried to curate based on um, both suggestions and pretty questions. There's the good news is there's so much going on, I can't cover everything. But if you're interested in a topic that I don't do, there will be time um, for discussion at the end of session. So um, welcome, I'm very grateful to be here today. So I always like to start with a little history um, for people who uh, are newer to CF, um, they may not know this. Um, for When I've discussed this with people who've um, had been involved with CF for a long, long time, they generally appreciate it. So this is how we got where we are today. Um, cystic fibrosis was first described as a distinct entity um, in the 1930s by a female pediatrician pathologist named Dorothy Anderson. Um, and it, it's called cystic fibrosis because of the pancreatic abnormality, not because of lung disease. And it was known to be hereditary because on average, one in four siblings with CF also have CF. Um, and this also means that it's recessive. It's not passed from every parent who has it to every child, um, but you have to have two genes that are abnormal um, from one coming from each parent in order to have CF. So that was known well before um, it was known what that gene was. Um, a big innovation um, in CF care was um, the result of a heat wave in New York City in 1948. And um, that is shown here. Um, there were lots of paper, there are lots of old newspaper things for that. But the importance of that is that many kids who've been diagnosed with CF presented to the hospital, baby's hospital in New York at that time, now called Morgan Stanley Children's Hospital. Um, and the doctors there noticed that um, people with CF had an incredible amount of salt in their sweat and they came in with very low salt levels in the blood. And that led to the sweat test, which, which became a diagnostic test for CF and really allowed us to understand a lot more about this. It's important, especially for this audience, to recognize that the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation was founded by parents. And it was, this was in 1955 um, because um, families had gotten together and they recognized that their children had a very uh, serious disease. At that time, life expectancy was about five years. And they developed this foundation. And the first thing that they did was that they opened care centers that from the start were multidisciplinary. So CF care centers have doctors, nurses, dietitians, social workers, respiratory therapists. Um, and uh, just by focusing on concentrating care um, and getting um, people to really pay attention to people with this rare disease, life expectancy between uh, the 1960s and the 1980s increased into the 20s, which is a very sobering thing to think about. But on the other hand, that's a quadrupling of life expectancy, even though the cause of CF was not known. And then in the 1980s, um, the epithelial salt transport abnormality in the cells was discovered to be abnormal. And you would 
expect this really from the sweat chloride. There are lots of ion channels, things that transport salt in the body. And so there was a flurry of investigation to see if one of these was the problem with CF, but they were not the answer. And uh, right smack in the middle of the 1980s, I graduated from medical school. Um, so it's also important to know that without treatment, um, CF gets worse quickly. That goes along with the life expectancy of people who were not treated or minimally treated. There's malnutrition and vitamin deficiency and the lung disease starts early. This is a rather shocking picture um, from the Journal of Pediatrics back in 1949. Um, and even when I was starting my training, this was not an unusual situation where you'd get a child who came in who was very, very malnourished and already had lung disease at just a few years old. So um, fast forward, um, and I, I'm just gonna pose a question to you. Why do you think these men are drinking whiskey at 10 o'clock in the morning in what is clearly an academic office full of medical journals and um, coffee. So these folks are Francis Collins, Lapchi Sway, and Jack Reardon. And what they did was they discovered the gene that is abnormal in cystic fibrosis. And I like to show this picture um, because um, this is the Science Magazine issue in 1989 that described in three articles how they discovered this gene and proved that it was from that. Oh, I didn't, somebody, somebody's marking on here. Okay, um, my kids are older, but I remember this from other, other times. Um, but the other thing I like to show, so this was, this was a picture taken in 2009 so that was 20 years later. Um, but this little kid on the cover of Science Magazine is this guy who spoke at the North American CF conference that year. And, and what they discovered um, was the uh, gene, but they also discovered um, the mutation. And now the preferred terminology is variant F508-DEL or Delta F508, um, which it was 70% of people who they studied had at least one copy of this gene variant. And without going into too many details, um, I will just tell you that those ion channels that were being interrogated are very, very small proteins. And without expecting you to understand um, structural protein chemistry um, or uh, genetics, um, although some of you may so like, this is a very long, complex gene with, with a lot of active elements. And it's a huge protein. And this was a bit of a surprise at the time, but also um, explains why uh, kicking CF is so complicated. So um, I think everyone on the call knows this, um, that CF affects many, many organ systems. And um, some people have all of these and some have only a couple, but um, it's a complex disease that affects many parts of the body. What I wanna emphasize more is that um, there are genetic um, contributions to disease severity. One is the CFTR genotype. That's what CF genes are abnormal, the specific variation in that gene that causes diseases in an individual. But the CFTR genotype is only um, really robust in predicting who has pancreatic exocrine insufficiency, which means they need to take enzymes. Um, there is some contribution to lung disease, infection with CF and other issues, um, but there are also a host of other genes that can contribute to whether or not those complications develop. And then particularly in the lung, um, there is a major contribution from the environment and what we call stochastic factors, um, which has to do with things like uh, healthcare and airway clearance. Um, and this is also a pretty complex slide that I use to teach um, medical students and other doctors. Um, but the reason I put it up is because as we get into discussing modulators, it's important to see 
that there are different ways in which the gene abnormality causes a dysfunction of the protein. So CFTR is a protein, the gene codes for it. Um, so um, these are uh, types that were developed by Ed McCone and colleagues in the United Kingdom. And there are other classification systems that are used, but class one mutations make no protein whatsoever. Um, they actually, the, the genetic code says, stop making protein when it's too early. That's where the variation is. Class two mutations make a protein, um, but the protein folds the wrong way. And what happens when you have misfolded protein in your body is that the cellular housekeeping system says, that's no good. And it, ba it basically destroys it. So it's there, but it's, it's within the cell. It doesn't get to the plasma membrane and most of it goes away. And this is important um, because that's where the F508 DEL protein is. And that's why it's been complicated um, not to crack. Um, these uh, class three mutations have a, uh, have a gene defect that allows a fully formed um, protein to be developed, but it blocks its opening to let chloride out in the respiratory um, cell or to reabsorb it in the sweat gland. And so um, this is where we have uh, G551D and many other mutations um, that are that, are, that can be treated with colitico alone. Um, and then these milder mutations are um, rarer. They are associated with, with pancreatic sufficiency or no need to take enzymes, but there are still major effects on the lungs. Interestingly, those effects can be delayed. So before newborn screening, we used to see people with those gene mutations um, present later in childhood or in adolescence and adulthood. So this gets complicated quickly because there are over um, 2,000 CFTR variants that have been described. Um, we only know of uh, slightly short of 300 that definitely cause disease. And that is because if you have only one person who's been described to have a variant, even if they have disease, you can't be 100% sure if that's the cause of the disease or if there's another variation or another type of problem with how the gene is regulated in that person. Um, so in other words, some people have very rare mutations. And then we also have an increasing number of children who have a positive newborn screen and don't definitely have cystic fibrosis that have elevated sweat chlorides below the diagnostic range or variants of unknown significance. And so we're learning more very quickly, but it gets complicated fast. Um, one of the things that's important to know before we get to what's going on in the pipeline is that there has been a history of improved um, CF management even well before um, we knew the gene that caused it, and it's been accelerating over time. Um, so in terms of treatments, um, when I was a young doctor, um, coded enzymes were first available. Before that, people had to take powdered enzymes, which don't work very well. Um, they started using inhaled colistin for pseudomonas infections. The discovery um, that a high fat or at least a liberal fat, high calorie diet helped people grow better and live longer and it was okay to give more enzymes was a huge change in CF care because prior to that, people were restricting fat in the diet because you know if you have less fat, then if your enzymes don't work, you have fewer abdominal symptoms, but you also don't get enough calories to grow well. Um, best therapy came in and then um, the first drug to be developed specifically for cystic fibrosis was Dornase Alpha, which you know and love as Pulmazyme. Um, and this was um, quite remarkable. This was in, uh, approved in 1994, which was just the time that I joined Lurie Children's Hospital. And then a number of other treatments that improve lung disease, reduce infection. Um, and at the same time, there's been a ton of research um, not clinical trials that I'm gonna spend a lot of time on, but uh, discovering um, 
pseudomonas epidemiology, uh, researching whether newborn screening um, was going to help in CF. Um, and as you all know, newborn screening is now done in all of the United States and many parts of the world. Um, infection control practices, um, if you have a pseudomonas culture, trying to eradicate that with inhaled uh, tobramycin or as trianam. And then um, looking more efforts to look at measurable quality of life and then uh, quality improvement initiatives. And uh, the CF Foundation sponsored um, a special supplement to British Medical Journal Quality and Safety a number of years ago, which really described how, um, how much care improved and patient health improved by really paying attention to how care is given at care centers. Um, so this is, the, the CF Foundation does um, survival in uh, five-year increments. Um, and I just wanna take a minute to explain what median survival is. These, there are a lot of statistical methods that go into this. Um, and when you look at survival, um, for example, in the latest available uh, data, 2015 to 2019, many, um, there are people in that cohort who are much older. I, I know a number of people who are much older, um, but we still do have kids who have very severe disease. But um, what, what we've seen is continued acceleration of life expectancy. So I, I told you we were up to the early 20s um, by the 1980s, and we've more than doubled that. And, and with um, new therapeutic approaches, I think we will see further inflection that curve. So now we're gonna to move towards um, our goals, which is to have a normal length and quality of life. Um, so for those of you who have not seen a slide like this before, um, it takes a lot to make a new drug. Um, I'm gonna use modulators as an example. So this would be Kaleidico or Candy, Simdico and Trikafta. Um, that all started with preclinical phase and they used a high throughput screening. Cells with mutations where you can, can test thousands and thousands of chemical compounds um, to see if the CFTR function can be improved. In other words, have something that looks like it restores missing function from that CF gene mutation. And this was started um, way back um, in, the, in the 90s. Um, and it was funded by the CF Foundation. There was a company called Aurora Biosciences. Um, that company was purchased by the company Vertex. Um, but the foundation put a lot into the high throughput screening program so um, what happened was they had a number of lead compounds and some of these were studied further, but um, had various problems with them. And then once you have something that looks like it might be a treatment for CF or another disease, you have to do a lot of drug profiling. And that includes um, looking at animal models for toxicity. So um, this is usually done in rats and they want to make sure that there are no major organ effects, you know, that the liver doesn't get damaged, that the heart doesn't get damaged, things like that. It's a very standardized approach. Um, at the time of this early development, we did not have good animal models that had CF. And, and even now, um, the, the ones that are available are very complicated and they're not used for drug studies. And then we get into the part that um, some of you um, may have participated in or had family members who participated in, the clinical studies. So phase one studies are short studies with intensive monitoring um, that look 100% at safety in humans because humans are not rats. Um, and uh, once that, and these are often done in healthy populations, but sometimes they are done in people who are affected. Um, they're pretty small studies. Phase two clinical trials are smaller studies where they look at um, a, generally a couple of months, um, can be a little bit less, can be a little bit more of 
additional safety in people with CF in this case. And they also look at whether there's evidence that um, a treatment might work. So one of those um, things in evidence for CFTR modulators is the sweat chloride. Because they work on the gene defect, the sweat chloride goes down. And so, um, but they also always look at lung function in um, these populations. And I will tell you that phase two studies are generally not done in children because um, they have, uh, the safety profiles are, are well studied that they don't have to go back to that drawing board. Um, and then phase three are these larger uh, controlled clinical trials that go six months or more where um, half the, patients get a placebo and half get the drug to see if there's a benefit of the drug. This is industry standard. It's been done for years this way. But I will also note that um, in the child extension studies, they're generally open label, meaning that every child who participates gets drug because in the United States and in Europe, um, it's all about safety. And then, of course, you measure whether there seems to be a benefit, but it's not placebo control. From here to here, historically, um, takes about 20 years. Um, but we have sped that up, um, both in the, uh, the clinical trials community and particularly the CF Foundation by development of the Therapeutics Development Network. This is an infographic that just goes through this in more detail. Um, and this is available on cff.org. But uh, you see the phase one, phase two, and, and phase three, and then everybody sits and waits for FDA approval. Um, we're all familiar with that, um, with other things going on in the country now. I also just want to note that, very important, not on the other slide, um, that there is a phase four. And in phase four, um, there are two things that um, happen. Um, one is, the most important is that patients who are in, people with CF who are in a phase three trial are asked to do a follow-on study so that we can get more data. And they're still getting uh, their drug dispensed from our research pharmacies. They are still um, getting research uh, labs done more frequently than, than they would clinical ones. Um, and so, and this helps look, first of all, does it does the drug continue to work? And then also, are there rare or unusual side effects that we didn't see over a six to 12 month period? I would also say that these phase four studies, now many of them are actually up to about two years. Um, the one for Trikafta in uh, six to 11 year olds has been, is gonna go on longer because um, we were doing that study in um, the pandemic and we had missing safety data because people couldn't get into um, the centers. There were so many centers worldwide that were on lockdown. Um, so there's another element that's required by the FDA now, which is to do more monitoring people who are simply prescribed the drug. We call those real world studies. Um, so, you know, I used to be able to go through the CF Foundation Therapeutics Pipeline on a single slide, and I used to know everything about every drug being studied. And I'm happy to say that that is no longer true. But I do, and I'm not going to dwell on every single compound here, but more um, the uh, why, how, what of uh, the expanding pipeline. So. Um, we all know that what, what we're working towards is a one-time cure, but until that time, um, drugs that improve the CFTR function um, clearly have the most benefit for people with CF. Um, and about 90% of people with CF make an abnormal protein. So that's why I showed you the, the slide with the different things that can go wrong within the cell. Um, about 10% of people don't. So modulators work to overcome protein defects. Um, so the protein works better um, and works more like what we in science call the wild type um, or normal CFTR. Um, gene editing and gene therapy um, 
can actually introduce normal DNA in one way or another into any cell with CF. And I will tell you that within a year after the discovery of the F508 Dell mutation, scientists were successful in gene uh, replacement um, to restore CFTR function, but only in cells. And there have been uh, clinical trials um, up through phase two of gene therapies um, since the 1980s. So this is, I'm, I'm sorry, the 1990s. So this is, this is a difficult puzzle to crack. So when I say they're in early development, um, we also have to be honest that it's taken a lot to iterate what can be done. The flip side is that a lot more is known about gene therapy um, and, and what works and what doesn't. And there are other approaches um, to gene therapies as well. So um, one of them are RNA therapies. And these are, this is very complex, but basically it kind of tricks the body into um, making the normal protein, even with the defect in its own DNA. Um, and these have been successful in other disorders. As a pediatric pulmonologist, I treated many patients with that even rarer than CF disease called spinal muscular atrophy. Um, those babies are born um, with very weak muscles and in the severe forms, they're unable to breathe on their own within the first couple of years of life. So this, this type of therapy has been very successful in uh, hugely improving the clinical course of those children. So that's just an example. But so there are lots of different types of things in, in this pipeline. You know about the modulators um, that I mentioned earlier. Um, there are a number of additional modulators in development um, and some competition for Vertex in this space. And then the ones that are more in the gene editing um, or RNA therapies are still in preclinical development, but we're watching that very closely, of course. Um, Improving mucociliary clearance has been a goal since um, CF was really first um, studied um, in, I know adults with CF who were put to bed in mist tents because it was thought that breathing in mist would make your mucus thinner. It's not true. And the kids who are now adults hated it. Um, so don't do that. But um, we now have uh, Pulmozyme, which was our first drug, hypertonic saline, which is just, um, sterile water that is the salinity has salt content of ocean water. Um, and then uh, a newer one called Bronchitol um, that's been available in some other countries for a while, but is relatively new to the United States. And this is a dry powdered inhaler. It causes a lot of cough um, and it's mostly used in adults. Um, and then there are others that are under development, including um, something that we've been looking at for a long time, which is uh, manipulating a sodium channel in the lung to secrete more sodium because that also rehydrates the airway surface liquid. Um, so, so the rationale for all of this is that the airway surface in CF is very dry. That's why thick sticky mucus accumulates and that increases infection symptoms. And this, this class of drug um, restores airway surface liquid and that reduces symptoms and exacerbation. And these drugs are still very fundamental to treatment. We can use them, um, the first two, homozyme and hypertonic saline in young children. They've been extensively tested in young kids and used widely and have been available for a long time. Um, many older people with CF have uh, bronchiectasis and really need to, and, and people with bronchiectasis have secretion movement problems. So um, these continue to be an important class of drugs. And then of course we have to have better options as we're waiting treatments for people who aren't modulator um, eligible. Anti-inflammatory agents have a very storied past. Um, there were some trials of prednisone done when I was um, a pulmonary fellow uh, prednisone makes lung function worse and has a ton of complications. And 
Uh, some of you or family members of yours may have taken prednisone for long periods of time, so you understand that. Um, so there was a, um, an anti-inflammatory study, gosh, probably about 20 years ago that um, actually made people worse. And we had to stop that trial due to uh, an interim safety analysis. But we, we learn from everything that doesn't work um, to make better drugs. And so there are anti-inflammatories under study still. Um, in, um, in the case of anti-infectives, um, chronic infection is a big issue in the CF lung. And when you get a chronic infection, um, that increases, and, and that's one that doesn't come and go, but is there all the time. And, and this is pertinent only to some organisms that can be cultured but it increases the rate of lung function decline and the number of pulmonary exacerbations that need antibiotics or hospital stays. Um, Pseudomonas is the biggest problem historically in CF. Um, many people still have pseudomonas, but with newborn screening, we're seeing a significant drop in the rate of people who have pseudomonas. Um, which we attribute partly to early nutrition and partly to the fact that uh, kids born in the era of newborn screening were all seen at CF care centers and, and families were counseled to do really um, excellent uh, infection control measures. Um, but there are other um, bugs that are becoming more common, including uh, atypical mycobacteria. And then we also have a problem of antibiotic resistance. And so some of the um, approaches like uh, gallium and nitric oxide, these aren't antibiotics. They actually help the body uh, get rid of the germ more, um, more efficiently. So um, still a lot to do in that space. And then of course, nutrition and GI therapies have been important. Um, Aquadex uh, was developed, was um, studied within the Therapeutics Development Network. Um, it's got anti-inflammatory uh, properties. Um, taking vitamins doesn't excite people. And actually among all of the very difficult things I ask my patients to do, um, forgetting to take vitamins is one of the biggest reasons for um, not completing all the therapies that you're supposed to do. Um, even though it's easy, it's just not, you know, lots of people take vitamins, but it is important. Um, better enzyme products. Um, and uh, then uh, for those of you who use or have family members who use tube feeding, Relizorb is a, an, a cartridge that can be used overnight that has lipase that helps digest fat, which can um, obviate the need to crush enzymes or wake up to take extra doses of enzymes. Um, and then there are some other um, ones under study, um, including uh, synthetic pancreatic enzymes. And those have been studied for some time. And the advantage to that is that they don't have, um, they don't have issues with uh, a very rare problem of pork allergy because all enzyme products come from pork. And there are also concerns that um, the, there might be a problem with pigs where pigs get sick and there's an enzyme storage because of that, because you, you probably didn't know this and it's probably not what you came here for, but um, the pigs whose pancreases are used to make enzymes are from very specific um, large pork operations. And you cannot assume that a different uh, pig in a different environment is gonna be the same enzyme. This is strictly regulated, regulated by the Food and Drug Administration. But nutrition is important. Um, it, uh, we know that um, better growth and muscle mass and higher body mass index um, are associated with better lung health, quality of life and life expectancy. And this is just a slide getting back to what I said before that when you look at lung disease, lots of things affect it. And so, um, and we don't even understand all of those things, but um, we know that um, there are lots of things, including luck, 
um, that can influence lung health. So we've got a lot of other important studies going on. I'm just going to highlight a couple of them, but a, some of the goals that I'm going to discuss are um, tailoring therapy appropriately and learning more about effects of modulators after they're approved. So um, when the first modulator was FDA approved and we started prescribing Polydico, the first question that everybody asks is, can I stop doing other treatment now? <laughs> um, and um, people continue to ask that. And I remember when Orcambi came out, um, I saw a kid who said, who had met Bob Bell, the former uh, CEO, now two CEOs ago of the CF Foundation. And Bob had said that we were working on a once a day pill that would make it not necessary to take other treatments. And I will say that that continues to be true, but um, this kiddo was very upset with me when I said, we don't stop your other treatments. This just helps you stay healthier. Um, but um, the fact is that when we do clinical trials, we have um, the people who volunteer to be in clinical trials tend to be the people who really want to at least try every treatment that might help them. Um, so we always try to look at the burden of care and talk about working care into your life. Um, but these are highly treated uh, people. And when you um, start a clinical trial, you never withdraw other drugs they're taking because if your polyzyme is working and it does work, then your lung function might go down. So people are asked to stay on stable therapy. So every study, and this is partly an ethical thing too, people stay on their treatment. So we just don't know. And so the CF Foundation is sponsoring this study called Simplify. And this is sort of the first step in therapy simplification. So this is a, actually a simple study. Um, people who take Trikafta are eligible um, if they're also taking hypertonic saline or pulmozyme or both. Um, and they're randomized to withdraw one usual therapy or stay on the usual therapy. And it's a couple of months study with the main outcome measure being um, lung function, but also looking at things like quality of life. So, um, and inhaled therapies are the focus because that's what people have the most trouble with um, doing their most burdensome. They take more time. You've got to uh, sterilize and clean, sterilize and dry those nebulizers. So they're quite a bit of burden. So this is underway. Um, as you might imagine, people um, who are eligible are very interested in this study. Um, so uh, we hope to have some results um, relatively soon. Another study that we're doing, and I've also had lots of um, questions from people over the years about this, is um, a study to evaluate treatment of pulmonary exacerbations in children. This is a pilot phase. There are only 10 um, sites out of the uh, almost 90 in the TDN network. Um, and we are one of them at Lurie Children's. And um, this is a, this is a, this was designed to test whether it's really necessary to start antibiotics within a few days of having an increased cough. There's some data that that helps, but it's all observational. In other words, um, our center did this and it seems to help. So um, kids are enrolled when they're healthy. And then when they have a mild exacerbation, meaning one that does not require them to be hospitalized, they're randomized, meaning, you know, flipping a coin and assigned to either antibiotics plus increased airway clearance, which is what, what we currently do, or increased clearance only. And it, it's called, that's called tailored treatment because um, if, symptoms persist and you're only on airway clearance, antibiotics are added. So we're really looking at that question that 
parents ask me all the time, is it really necessary to start an antibiotic now? And, and I will say, you know, there are cases where it seems so mild or already resolving that we do just um, enhance their weakness, but we don't, we need more research to know that we're giving the best care. Um, Another study that's very important for the network is called PROMISE, and this enrolls people who are taking Trikafta, um, and, and we do uh, similar measures to those that were done in the clinical trials. So sweat chloride, lung function, um, but also additional measures that aren't routinely done in the clinical trials, like uh, looking at um, markers of diabetes um, in blood tests, and also uh, looking at culture results and whether we're modifying the cultures in that. So this study was started after the initial approval of Trikafta for patients who are 12 and older, and then um, has now been extended to six to 11 year olds. Um, and uh, one of the nice things about this that people like is that they get their uh, sweat results back and they like to see that. Um, by the way, sweat, sweat chloride drop is not necessarily associated with lung function improvement, but it does mean that um, the drug is working on your CFTR to make it function better. So now let's talk a little bit more about where we are with modulators. Um, and I'm gonna start again with the historical slide. Some of you may remember um, this, uh, the Precision Medicine Initiative. Um, and this was announced by um, then President Obama um, at near the end of his uh, second term in the White House. Um, and this is really based on um, bringing better medicine to all people, but particularly for rare disease. Um, and so during this um, conference, he brought out um, this gentleman, uh, Bill, um, and said he's alive thanks to Kaleidico, a treatment of a particular form for his cystic fibrosis and a remarkable drug that treats the underlying cause of the CF rather than the symptoms. And so um, our first CFTR modulator, uh, Kaleidico, was um, the publication was in uh, 2011, approval in 2012. And um, these are graphs from the New England Journal of Medicine article, but what I want you to look at is how much lung function went up very quickly, very remarkably, uh, about 10% predicted and sustained over a six month period. Um, this is a quality of life indicator, um, also went up rapidly, was sustained. This is the number of patients who um, were not hospitalized with a pulmonary exacerbation. That's what event-free means. So many fewer patients on drug versus placebo. And then people gained weight well. And um, I had the privilege of being a principal investigator at the then Children's Memorial Hospital for this study. And it was really amazing to see. Um, we're supposed to be blinded, but you could tell who was on treatment very easily. And I'm not gonna go through all of this, but that there's been lots and lots of additional approvals, um, including the fact that um, the FDA, for the first time in its history, approved drug based on only cell studies for people with very rare mutations. Um, and now as of this year, um, we are approved for four months and older, um, and we're doing studies of kids less than four months old. Um, this is now comprises 82 mutations, but uh, only eight to 9% of people with CF um, can benefit from this drug by itself. Um, one of the things that I did want to note um, is that this was not really studied in older people, but um, when I was taught about CF, I was told that the pancreatic problem really was developmental. It developed in utero. Um, and once a baby was born, you wouldn't get pancreatic function back. That was untrue. By the way, I was also taught that when you had bronchiectasis, you wouldn't get lung function back. And I used to tell my patients that the best they could have with a highly effective therapy was stabilization. So wrong and wrong, and that's all for the good. Um, but we measure uh, an enzyme called elastase in the stool of babies diagnosed with CF to test whether their pancreas is working. 
Um, and we studied that in this um, study of 12 to 24 month olds. And what we saw is that many, many kids actually brought their um, enzyme level above that in which someone normally needs enzymes. Um, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on our candy um, because for people who are uh, over six, um, it's really been replaced by Trikafta. But I will say it was FDA approved. It gives um, an improvement in lung function and pulmonary exacerbation uh, rates, but, but it's less of an effect than Kalydeco. And I won't put the graphs, I didn't put the graphs side by side. It does reduce the decline in lung function over time though this showing people who over a couple of years took this drug versus no drug. Um, so, uh, so that is something that we're always looking at. Um, but uh, more pertinently to the current time is that uh, this drug improves pancreatic function in two to five-year-olds. So I showed you the data on Kalydeco in one to two-year-olds. But um, this is a study that was published a couple of years ago, and we do see kids who um, are having some are retaining pancreatic function, and um, the 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 average is going up in all of the kids. So that is probably associated with the good weight gain we saw in this study, and we're now studying this in one to two year olds. Um, because it's going to be a while before we have Trikafta um, available. And so um, Trikafta, I think everybody's heard about. Um, this is what's called a visual abstract from the New England Journal of Medicine. Great improvements in lung function and also um, in reduced pulmonary exacerbations and other markers. And this was called a biomedical breakthrough of the year by Francis Collins. That name sounds familiar because he was one of those guys drinking whiskey. He is now, the, uh, he directed the Human Genome Project and now directs the National Institutes of Health. And he played his guitar and sang to us at the North American CF Conference in 2019, which was shortly after the um, Trikafta approval. Um, so uh, as you know, um, we have um, results, study results available and published um, for the six to 11 year olds that's been FDA approved. I will tell you, we, the reason it was so fast after the 12 to 18 year old approval um, compared to Glydeco was the decision to do early studies before we had results in those older patients. And this was very controversial among um, the research community, but it was not controversial among parents. Um, and ethically, we always describe all risks. Um, we have completed the part A study of two to five-year-olds and the part B study has been initiated. Several sites are open and recruiting two to five-year-olds. Um, so that's really exciting. Now, I do want to highlight um, something that's an issue in the CF community now, which is that although overall about 90% of people with CF will have an F508 DEL mutation um, and therefore be eligible eventually, at least for Trikafta, we have significant differences in the distribution of gene variants by ancestry. Ancestry is not the same thing as race. Um, but we've known about differences in CFTR mutations in minoritized populations for a long time. I mean, so uh, one of the things that the CF Foundation is focusing now is um, healthcare equity in CF and developing um, new solutions for people um, who have, don't have a current uh, modular solution. Um, so, um, we are, there are additional modulators in development. Um, we, Trikapta is great, um, but there is a, another study that is going to be implemented soon that um, essentially, essentially takes Trikapta from being a twice a day dosing to a once a day dosing. And um, 
people with CF and their families um, are the best at taking medicine of anyone I've ever worked with, but you will still have more, um, you'll forget more doses on a twice a day medication than a once a day medication. That's all medications, all conditions. Um, there also might be steadier drug levels, which could have some clinical benefit. We don't know that now. We'll, we'll need to see the uh, pharmacokinetics, those drug level studies from the clinical trial. Um, and then the other thing that's important to know is that Vertex um, really has a monopoly right now. Um, I mean, they were the first and they've done great work. So uh, more competition um, will help the community and give them more choices. So the goal is uh, curative therapy for all, um, but until then, um, we are focusing on overcoming basic defect um, in people who are have rare, um, less known mutations or are modulator ineligible, um, as well as continuing to do a number of studies. I had a couple of pre-questions, and I know we're um, close to the end of the hour already, but. Um, Met, can medications be discontinued if you're on a highly effective modulator? We don't know, but um, I told you about Simpla at five studies, so we'll know more soon. Um, benefit of or can be in children who are not old enough to take trikafta. Um, again, in the two to five-year-old studies, and, um, and we'll have some data in the one to two-year-old studies soon, um, or can be safe and be a weight gain and pancreatic function. Um, improvement is sustained over a 96 week study um, after that. And, and we published that in Lancet Respiratory Medicine earlier this year. Um, there's also an interesting thing that, that, that it's much smaller studies, but the sweat chloride drop is more. So maybe that um, we know that inflammation and other things that happen in your body can make your CFTR downregulated. In other words, even if it works better, you might have less of it. So, so that, that suggests um, that there could be additional benefit, um, but it, you can't really extrapolate that far, but I think it's interesting. And then um, the mental health issues, there are studies going on using de-identified medical records these are some of the real world studies that I developed. And then there is required monitoring by the company. And that's why if, if, if some of you have been um, with Vertex and the Compass program, um, they will call you and ask you about stuff going on. And I know many of my patients and families have been a little bit annoyed by that, but actually what they're looking at is whether, you know, you have new symptoms and whether um, that could be related. And doctors um, can submit uh, questions, can submit concerns to an FDA um, arm called MedWatch, where they look at what's being reported and look for patterns. So it's not the best answer, but that is what's happening right now. So now I'm going to stop sharing and open it up for uh, questions from the audience. Thank you, Dr. McCauley, for that informative presentation. Um, if you do have a question for Dr. McCauley, uh, please use the chat feature to enter it. Or at this point, I think we have a few minutes, so you can always unmute yourself and uh, ask directly if you prefer. Just keeping a monitor on the chat for a moment, but uh, I think so far everybody's found it very informative, but yeah, we're really excited to find out more about the PROMISE studies as they uh, advance, the PROMISE and Simplify. I think those are top of mind for uh, so, many of our, so many of our patients. Uh, phage therapy, is there a future for it? Uh, if I'm saying that correct, P-H-A-G-E, phage? Yeah, um, that's a really good question. So phage uh, therapy approaches are actually very exciting and there are reports in the literature of their successful use. Um, for, for those of you who aren't familiar with these, the best way I can describe it is it's sort of a virus-like um, uh, compound that destroys bacteria in a non-antibiotic um, mediated way. And so particularly for people with severe or highly resistant infections, there are um, trials being started. And so um, that's, uh, it's a really exciting line 
of investigation that's particularly pertinent to people who are older or who have more advanced lung disease. Another question that came in, do we know when the Simplify study will conclude and the results will be shared? I would anticipate that the Simplify study results will be available this time next year, just based on recruitment. One of the um, limitations in recruitment has been the ongoing pandemic. Um, so there are people who understandably um, want to really limit their time anywhere but home. Um, and there are also, um, uh, you know, people who are preferring telemedicine. So you have to do some in the clinic procedures for it. Nevertheless, because people are interested, the recruitment is going well. By the way, I could never say it in a drug study because if it's, uh, you know, um, it's got uh, Security and Exchange Commission implications, <laughs> but, but recruitment is going well. So I'm hoping by this time next year. Um, it's not just completing the study, it's doing all the analysis and there are um, arduous techniques like data cleaning that have to occur. Awesome. Um, well, I don't see any additional questions coming through. So I know how valuable your time is, Dr. McCauley. Uh, so thank you so much for uh, giving us this update uh, to the uh, local community here. I hope uh, everybody found it informative. Uh, stay tuned because we will be announcing our next uh, CF Town Hall coming up in September very shortly. So uh, again, thank you all for joining us and a special thank you again to Dr. McCauley uh, for all of the information shared here today. So you all have a great uh, rest of your week and uh, please contact us if there's any other information we can help provide to you and your families. And I'd like to thank you all for coming. I, I appreciate your attention and um, the warm greetings and feedback. Awesome. Take care. Well, thanks again, everybody. Thank you. Bye.